Welcome, everyone. So good to see you all in the room. Welcome, everybody who's joining us online. So good to have you with us today. I'm Brett Theodos. I'm a senior fellow at the Urban Institute and lead our research on mission finance and community development. And I'm so excited to dig in today for a what I really hope and anticipate is going to be a forward-looking discussion about how we can best serve, how we can best engage, how we can best support a diverse landscape of multifamily housing developers and development. Of course, knowing that to look forward, we also have to do a good job of looking back and preferably to do that with data. And I just want you to know we've got you covered and we're going to do that together today. But the main point of what we're going to be doing together here is dialogue. And so we're going to get to hear from some incredible folks who are doing incredible work. So Urban Institute, if you don't know us, we're a more than 50-year-old institution where dialogue is welcome. And we're bringing insights to bear on the challenges in many of our communities, uh, urban and rural, actually, um, focused across health, across education, across tax, certainly focused on housing. Uh, as you'll see and hear in the data, we have a lot of ground to cover uh, collectively to live up to the promises and ideals that we've articulated about creating this land as an opportunity for all. Real estate development, it should be acknowledged at the gate, is just one of many sectors where these disparities are evident. And yet, even so, some things are going to be you know, macro and, and meta solutions, but we are also going to need to have sector-specific solutions. And so that's part of what we're dialoguing here around today. And of course, development matters greatly for cities, for communities, for residents, tax bases, and the like. So you'll get to hear two panels today. First is a rock star set of developers who are doing the work, and we wanted to lead with their perspective. Also get to hear from folks in government and in lending to hear about the support and other sectors that are engaging along the way, all of it being necessary. Uh, a big thanks to our philanthropic sector. Wouldn't be here doing this dialogue, collecting this data without them. So in particular, to Kelly Ann, to Senthal over there, they've created the Equity Fund. You're going to hear a little bit about that and the work supporting fellows to our CDFI partners uh, who are delivering through that channel and others. A big thanks. Um, Personal point of privilege, also a big thanks to Wells Fargo. They didn't sponsor this event, but they did support the research on seven of the 10 cities that we're releasing today. And so uh, they're growing diverse housing developers initiative and the CDFIs there, as well as, as this work with Amazon has really been a beautiful um, partnership in seeing things move forward and, and really insights be built and solutions be tested and scaled. Uh, so thanks to Connie there as well. OK, so we have a couple of housekeeping items that we want to go through. The first is that this is being recorded. So you all are not on camera, but just know that. Uh, and it, this is going to be posted online after the event on the same page uh, that the event registration was at. Uh, you can get live captions if you're listening in right now. You can adjust that at the bottom of your media player. Um, we do want audience Q&A and engagement. And so we're hoping that you can put that in and uh, click the QR code and drop in your question if you're here or uh, put it in the Q&A box for those who are joining online. And we will filter those questions in uh, via that little device there and fold them into our discussion. So please do add your questions. Um, we're happy to get in the weeds as well as be pic big picture at the same time. And we've got a hashtag live at Urban if you want to um, hit us on social. We also, our events team loves to get surveys and tell us how we did. So uh, we'll send you a link, but if you don't mind filling it out as well. And we have a reception afterwards. So after we get to be all together in this form, we get to be together again in a little more informal way. Wanted to do on the roof. Um, I don't know. So uh, it's a little hot. Um, <laughs> but uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass to Kelly Ann uh, so we can get a philanthropic lens to start this work. Um, then we're going to go to my colleague Jorge, who's going to give us the data, and then right into the panels. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone in the room, and good morning and potentially good evening to those joining us virtually. My name is Kellyanne Kirkpatrick, and I have the tremendous privilege of being the grants and partnerships lead for Amazon's Housing Equity Fund. 
Amazon's housing equity fund is now a $3.6 billion fund to create and preserve affordable housing across three communities, including right here in the National Capital Region, the Puget Sound Region, as well as Nashville. To date, the fund has created and preserved over 21,000 affordable homes across these three regions. And we're so excited. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> And we're excited about the opportunity to do more. But along this journey, it has been absolutely amazing to work with the fantastic researchers at the Urban Institute to shine light on critical issues that are keeping us from housing more individuals and families. These critical issues are going to make a difference as we look at solutions to them in order to help solve the dearth of affordable housing and housing overall that this country needs. I am incredibly grateful to Brett and Jorge and the entire Urban Institute team for their tremendous work on the research that is released today and looking forward to the robust conversation that's to follow. Thank you all for the absolute joy that it is to have Amazon involved in this critical research. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for all the people who are tuning in also virtually. My name is Jorge Gonzalez. I'm a research associate here at the Urban Institute, and I'm here to offer you some numbers, as Brett mentioned. Uh, thank you, Kellyanne. Thank you to uh, our funders. Uh, this research that I'm going to be presenting about today was uh, supported by Amazon and Wells Fargo. So, uh, I'll be sharing uh, the results of our most recent study looking at the share of housing development that is done by developers of color and female developers. And we wanted to put some numbers into this discussion and help frame the conversation that we're going to have in a few moments. Uh, this is an important topic for two reasons. Uh, on one side, this is about equal opportunity in business. Real estate developers, despite what many people may think, uh, are also entrepreneurs. They're also, in many cases, small business uh, small business owners who are just looking to create wealth for themselves, for their families, for their communities. And developers of color and female developers should have the same opportunities to succeed in their business ventures just like any other entrepreneur. The other reason why this is important is because it matters for our housing markets, and this is something that affects all of us. It is well documented that our current housing affordability issues uh, are mostly explained by a lack of housing supply. And the reality is that we are not building enough housing to keep up with the new household uh, formation. We're not building housing at the rates that we used to in past decades even. And uh, this also includes multifamily housing, which is important to address housing affordability uh, due to a, a more efficient use of land. So it is in this context where we really need to boost housing development that we need all the players that can participate in this market to do so and to do so with equal opportunity. So to find out um, exactly what share of multifamily housing is done by developers of color and female developers, we did the following. Uh, we used data from 10 cities that we, uh, the 10 cities that we studied uh, on permits issued between 2019 and 2023 for multifamily housing developments with at least 10 units. And we combined this data with data from CoStar, which is a real estate data provider for projects that were built between 2019 and 2023. And then we identified the developers that were behind all of these projects. We classify them by uh, whether they're for-profit or non-profit, and then their footprint in terms of local, regional, or national. For for-profits, we classify them as being white-led or black-led or female-led. Uh, if the CEO or at least half of their founders, their owners, or their principals belong to that uh, group. And for non-profits, we did the same. If the CEO or at least 50% of the board of directors uh, belong to that uh, group, we classify that uh, development entity as such. So in the aggregate, what we found was around close to 1,400 unique active developers in these 10 markets, accounting for close to 400,000 units that are being built or rehabilitated, and those units being worth around $87 billion in assets. And these are either uh, recent sales prices or tax assessments or um, estimated development costs. And then in terms of race and ethnicity of the leadership, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, we found that in all cities, most development is done by development entities that are, have white leadership. 
But we did find significant groups of developers of color in certain cities. So for example, if we look at a city like Seattle or Los Angeles, there is an important group of Asian developers doing housing development there. If we look at uh, Washington DC or Chicago or Boston, there's an important group of black developers uh, being very active in these markets. Or if we look at Miami, it's very visible uh, the relevance of the Latino developer community in this market. But it is really when we look at how these shares uh, of uh, development entities compared to the makeup of the adult population in these cities that we can really appreciate how white developers are truly overrepresented uh, in these markets and in turn how developers of color are underrepresented. So you can see in this chart that San Antonio fares the worst among the 10 cities that we studied in terms of overrepresentation of white developers. So just to give you, put some numbers behind that, 26% of adults in San Antonio are white, but about 97% of multifamily housing development is done by white developers. In contrast, Seattle is the city that fares the best in terms of representation of developers of color. And this is in great part thanks to a very active group of Asian developers in that market. Overall, we found that among developers of color, Asian developers fared better in terms of representation uh, in almost all of the cities. In some places, even had they had an outsized output in terms of the housing units that they are producing and the property valuations of those projects. Black developers were underrepresented in all cities compared with their shares of the adult population. But again, as I mentioned, we still found some vibrant ecosystems of black developers in, in some cities. And sadly, Latino developers are the most underrepresented group, uh, racial or ethnic group across these 10 cities that we studied. When it comes to gender, similarly, we found that female developers are underrepresented in all of the cities, uh, ranging from 6% uh, of developers, for example, in Nashville, to 23% in Boston. But even in Boston, they are underrepresented when we, of course, uh, remember that women make up half of the population in that city and in all cities. So I wanna uh, show you some uh, details about individual cities and what we learn in each of these cities. And because we're in DC, why don't we start with Washington DC right now? So you, if you look at um, the leftmost block uh, here, you'll find that, for example, here is showing that 5%, around 5% of the adult population in DC are Asian. If we move on to the next block, we'll see that 2% of development entities that are active in DC are led by Asian people. Virtually none of the units or none of the property valuations uh, are done by these entities. This is uh, because the number is so close to 0%. Um, then we see 39% of adults in, this, in the district are black. They are leading about 12% of development entities, uh, doing about 6% of the units, representing about 5% of the values of those units. Latinos make up around 10% of the adult population in DC. They lead about 2% of the entities, 2% of the units, around 3% of the values. And then in contrast, 41% of adults in the district are white, but they lead about 84% of the active development entities, uh, producing around 92% of the units and 2% of the property valuations. Women are also underrepresented. Uh, they fall, uh, DC falls around the middle uh, across the 10 cities uh, when compared uh, in terms of gender uh, representation. A place like Seattle, uh, we have a pretty active group, as I mentioned, of Asian developers, uh, relatively better representation of women as well. And especially when we measure that uh, by the number of units that are being produced and their property valuations. In Nashville, black developers are underrepresented. We did not identify uh, a single Latino developer in the city, uh, at least that matched our criteria, and a fairly good representation of Asian developers. In terms of gender, I had talked about earlier about how Nashville fares the worst in terms of representation of women in the housing development sector. Chicago has a pretty active group of black developers. Uh, Pretty striking underrepresentation of Latino developers compared to their share of the adult population. And in terms of gender, around uh, in the middle when we compare it to the other nine cities in terms of development entities, but gets even worse when we look at the number of units and the value of those units that are being produced by these developers. I highlighted Miami also a moment ago. You can see how Latino developers are very active in this market. Uh, but when we consider that 71% of adults in Miami are Latinos, 
then we can really appreciate how this group truly is underrepresented in the industry. Uh, in terms of gender representation, Miami fares similarly to other cities in the group that we studied. Boston has a pretty active group of Asian and black developers, although black developers are then become slightly more underrepresented as we look into the units that they are uh, working on and also their associated values. Asian developers are even overrepresented in terms of values, but this is mostly due to uh, two very high, uh, very large high price uh, development projects that took place uh, that were uh, done by a, a nation led firm. Um, and again, not great representation of Latinos in this market. In terms of gender representation, Boston fares better compared to its peers, although this representation is considerably smaller when we measure it by the values um, of the properties. Dallas is another very diverse city, uh, but both black and Latino developers are underrepresented in this industry. Women fare similarly as in other cities, but is slightly better when, um, when the representation is measured by the values of the projects that they're leading. Los Angeles, a very Latino city, but again, Latinos underrepresented in the housing development sector. In contrast, Asian developers are relatively well represented and even punching above their weight in terms of units and values of those uh, projects compared to the number of entities that they lead in this market. Female developers uh, also fare better compared to other cities. Phoenix also showing pretty stark underrepresentation of black and Latino developers and an average representation for female developers compared to the other cities. And finally, San Antonio, as I mentioned earlier, has the worst representation of developers of color of the 10 cities that we studied. Most San Antonians are Latinos, but we found only one Latino-led developer that match our criteria. Um, you can find the 10 reports uh, looking in more detail to these results. Uh, those are live in our website. And I just want to conclude saying that, you know, as you see, we have a lot of room to improve equity in the multifamily housing development sector. Uh, but our two panels today will allow us to better identify what is behind some of these numbers, but even more important, what can we do to improve uh, and craft a path forward to a more equitable sector? Thank you all. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, and Jorge, thank you so much for uh, the great data. I think it's always great to kind of frame a discussion around real data and real context. Um, and being from the Boston market, um, great to see that data in real life. Uh, it kind of confirms some of the things that we know are inherent. Uh, and hopefully, some of the topics that we'll explore today uh, is, is expanding opportunities for developers of color. Um, privileged to be here to navigate this conversation, um, and my goal today is to do less talking than our panel. And so, please help me in, in doing that. But I'm, I'm really I'm joined today by a great uh, group of professionals and experts across the country that bring uh, some, a wealth of, of experience. Um, Leslie Bird of Alpha Sharp Development uh, from the Tacoma, Washington area. Uh, Jennifer Horn of Urban Campus and Core from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and two local uh, professionals, uh, Aisha Hudson of APEACE here in Washington, D.C., and finally, Raymond Nix of Nix Development Group um, in Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, so our conversation today really builds off uh, a conversation that's been happening across the country, but in particular, a conversation that has been a big part of the Urban Institute um, and in collaboration with Amazon, uh, digging into... Um, you know, understanding kind of opportunities and building off of a roundtable that was hosted earlier this year, a roundtable that had over about 30 stakeholders from a diverse sector, public, private, and philanthropic. And a big part of what we heard during that roundtable, we'll dig into some of these themes a little bit more today, um, themes around, you know, the entrepreneurial needs of, of developers of color, 
um, not just the importance to include developers of color, but really help empower them to lead um, in, in, their, in their trajectory. Um, really understanding and recognizing the access um, to opportunity is just as is crucial to the access to capital. Um, and really acknowledging and, and remembering the systemic barriers um, that we see um, play out in the data that we just saw um, and how to navigate those. Uh, and finally, two points around the vital role of government and policy solutions that we will hear more about in our second panel, um, as well as a shift in, in paradigm, right? Shifting our paradigm of not just focusing on uh, wage creation for developers of color, but really wealth creation. So that's our hope today is to dig further into those themes um, and, and dive right into the discussion. And hopefully we can lay the ground for some insights and leave the solutioning and further exploration for our, our second panel. Um, and so with that, I'd love to, to jump right in and, and, and talk about some of the systemic barriers that we just saw on screen uh, through Jorge's data. And, and really just ask, Jennifer, I'll, I'll start with you in terms of just trying to understand and unpack some of the challenges and systemic barriers that affect developers of color at various stages, you know, from aspiring to emerging and established. Sure. So I can give you a little bit of background on our firm. We started off about five years ago as a real estate advisor. So I came out of a 12-year career working for a larger institutional developer um, based out of Australia, but did a lot of work in a public-private partnership space across the U.S. And so doing that work, I was really comfortable with kind of these P3 concepts and leveraging that. And I was in a community in Nashville, so a bit of a unicorn, as you saw from the data. I'm a female black developer uh, in the Nashville market, but also because I'm a native Nashvillian. And so I saw my community changing and shifting in ways it wasn't comfortable with. And so I had grown up on these kind of public-private partnership structures, and I was wondering why more of our institutional landowners weren't leveraging those or using those. So I started out doing a lot of pro bono consulting and started an advisory firm mostly to get some insurance coverage so I didn't give bad <laughs> advice. And in that journey, having conversations with churches or universities or hospitals or other people who had been long-term members of our community and controlled land assets I realized there was a need for more development led by people that looked like me because there was an issue with trust. And so we quickly shifted from being an advisor to being approached and asked, could we be their developer? And I ran into all the challenges you just saw presented in the data, right? So it was like, well, what's your background and your experience and your track record? So we quickly made this jump into aspiring emerging developer. Um, and trying to figure out that path. And so for us, we were blessed with this window of opportunity that was presented by Amazon's Housing Equity Fund because we were able to kind of get that strategic enabler to help push us further into emerging, right? So we now had um, some support to build that capacity where I had 12 years of experience doing director of development operations for 42,000 single family rental units, right? So I had corporate experience, but how could I leverage that under my name? So when I would go to a bank, they're not going to underwrite me as an individual. So how do I even get to the table with kind of that initial work that has to be done? And that's where those kind of capacity building programs really took us from aspirational in terms of we had this idea to really becoming emerging so we could start down the process. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, Raymond, from your perspective, if you could just add um, a little bit more um, perspective uh, on that uh, question. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, and a pleasure to be here. So, you know, my, my two-second origin story is um, I worked for uh, two large national um, real estate development firms that specialized in the world of affordable housing and public-private partnerships. Um, I had gotten to a point where I was tired of getting on the airplane and I wanted to have a similar impact on, uh, we did Hope Six Projects, so we're a large scale that are partnered with public housing authorities. So I wanted to have the same type of impact, but I wanted to be able to be closer to my family um, and, and do it locally, which is Washington, D.C. So I realized very quickly that, you know, the, the two things. Uh, the first was, you know, I didn't have any money. Uh, I had a ton of what we call sweat equity, uh, but sweat equity can only take you so far. Um, the second thing that I realized after starting to have some initial conversations was uh, that I had risen to uh, the level of 
vice president of development with the last National Hope Six firm. So we were responsible for multiple cities. I had multiple DMs. I had real headcount. I had real responsibilities, and I was executing my own. Um, but none of that carries over to you when you create your own logo. When you create your own logo and it's time to sit in front of uh, you know, municipalities or lenders or tax credit investors, you know, there, there's usually a, a bold paragraph that says, describe <laughs> over the last five years three similar projects in size mm -hmm. and uh, you know, with this sponsor, with this firm. And you can write around it and you can kind of dance through it. But at the end of the day, uh, they really want you to uh, craft a new path. So that kind of pushed us into... Um, joint ventures, right? So my initial uh, firm that we created, I brought sweat equity, uh, my partners brought capital, uh, and we realized very quickly that we had to go from, uh, and Cynthia remembers this, what used to be called neighborhood investment fund studies, which were basically feasibility analysis that we thought would convert into real projects. The reality is, is that you know, those take a long time, and cash flow is very important for a business. So we had to get into uh, going after RFPs and doing actual development, which required partners. Mm -hmm. So we were you know, bumping up against the need for liquidity, net worth, balance sheet strength, uh, and it forced us into you know, the world of strategic joint venturing. Wonderful. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll definitely dig a little bit further into the JV um, partnerships and the importance of those. But something you both said, I just want to put a, a pin on that, is the trust. You, know, you use yeah. the words trust, um, and you also used, I think, used, didn't the words, but track record, right? right? The importance of trust and track record and sometimes the risk associated with that. So um, we'd love to, Aisha, I just want to pass the baton to you to maybe just add to this conversation around the systemic barriers. Sure. Um, my start was a little different. I was able to get into the market really early. Uh, bought my first property in 1999. I was an a owner occupant that ended up being a housing provider. So that start for me was really useful. I had a W-2 job the entire time, a public service worker since high school. The advantage that I had was getting into the market early. And so that's how I was able to build my, my equity. But now here I am as an emerging developer, and you kind of find yourself putting stuff on the line. Because if you don't have a JV, you have to be responsible for some, some sort of equity, um, putting a skin in the game, as it's called. And there's a lot of pre-development costs as well. So I have um, found myself leveraging property, which can put a strain on a business. So, you know, you're kind of back to square one, um, building it over again. So grateful, but it can mm -hmm. be challenging. Yeah, not, not yeah. without challenges. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so thank you for, for mentioning that, kind of that, that journey from aspiring to emerging. I want to bring it to you, Leslie, in terms of, you know, sharing a bit about your journey, um, you know, on that path from aspiring now to emerging and into the uh, established range. So, um, okay, certainly. So my name is Leslie Bird with Alpha Sharp. Uh, the business started with uh, myself and my business partner. And we started in 20, 2017. We decided that we wanted to be real estate investors. And uh, we had to create an approach to do that. And what we decided was we were going to muscle up and buy six units and then uh, perform the property management because we wanted to know what that entailed for anything in the future. Um, the next project from there, we purchased a single family house and added an ADU to it and then renovated the house. Uh, and then at the end of that project, I remember it was like, it was a pivot point. It was a canon event in our story. We were sitting there <laughs> for the Spider-Man fans. We were sitting there and on the porch and it overlooked downtown Tacoma, these beautiful water, beautiful mountains and everything. And, and, and realized that what we just did by kind of flipping this house and even adding the ADU, mm -hmm. we just made this place more expensive. We did not make any impact on the housing need. Um, and we decided that that was not the direction we wanted to go. We needed to figure out a way to do more and um, faster. And as a second, it also didn't make the money we thought it was going to make. So mm -hmm. we needed to figure out a way to make more money doing it to keep the ball rolling. Um, so what we did was, uh, so I come from an engineering background. I worked in aerospace for 12 years as an engineer, mm. and um, he was in uh, tech consulting and uh, lots of business, lots of business uh, background. And 
uh, we decided that we we're going to figure out a way to leverage what we have and go out there and make a development. Two smart guys with some experience, not in this industry, but adjacent industries, and, and um, try to make something happen. So what we did was we leaned on ourselves, uh, which is like the most risky thing to do at that point which, with our limited experience um, in the industry. And we went and bought a piece of land and assessed the, the zoning on it. And, and what ended up being, we found a, a little niche um, a, a, a little um, a space where we could play that the market hadn't really seen yet. So we developed a um, we developed a two million dollar building on a forty six thousand dollar piece of land by using the new upzoning the city had made there from four years prior that nobody else had invested in in that neighborhood um, to date. So we found this land and then. Going, you know, lucky for us, we found an architect who was just taking our money and doing nothing for us. So it forced us to lean in and figure out, well, how do we, what is this? How do we do it? Um, I took a cat computer aided drafting class to, because uh, I just didn't believe he was working on the drawings like he said he was. I'm like, this is not as hard as you say it is. I know it's not. Um, and then when I opened up the land use code and the uh, international building code and started putting the pieces together, it was like what I was doing for prior 12 years, reading FAA regulations and showing compliance to the FAA, I'm like, oh, well, you know, roll my sleeves up. I actually drew the building outline of an 11-unit apartment building that was sitting on a 3,000-square-foot lot. Um, uh, and the, took it to the city, gave the zoning and code analysis, um, and I did the permitting part myself because the architect wasn't going to do that. And the land use reviewer told us no. And we're like, no. Like, it says it right here, clear as day. Like, I read this type of language. Um, and we ended up elevating it to uh, in, inside the city. And the person who wrote it was still there, just had moved on and up to a different job. And they actually overturned our land use reviewers' uh, assessment of how we're intersecting the building code and the land use code to make this work for these, these 11 units. Um, and uh, that was the real spark, the real spark to what we're doing. Um, leaning in on, on our talents, um, figuring out our values, what's important to us. Uh, and then the financing part is a whole different uh, innovation um, that we'll get to in later yeah. questions. I, I love it. I love it. The canon moment. I'm going to definitely kind of you know, <laughs> yeah. capture that. And yeah. I think what I'm hearing in all of your stories is you know, the, the piv there are certain pivot points that happen. And I think you, your, your share that kind of progressed us to kind of the next topic is the various pathways, right, um, to progress uh, from leaning on your own unique talents. So, um, Jennifer, I'll, I'll pass it back to you if you could just share about some of the early stages of development in terms of how how you see pathways to progress, not just for you but for others mm -hmm. in the industry. Sure. So, I think for me, <laughs> we talk about a pivot. Mine was truly a COVID pivot because it was at a point where I was trying to explore ways to do work that I felt like was very meaningful and that I would be able to see the direct results from. And so looking at pathways, I think for a lot of developers who have this concept or idea of development, they've probably had some adjacency to real estate before. Because I don't know of too many like high schoolers who just brushed out and say, I want to be a developer when I grow up. Like I, there's usually an introduction. You had family in real estate or you have some adjacency or you've had exposure to kind of narrow and focus towards the path. I think there's a lot of great work that's happening around groups like Urban Land Institute does like some studies with high school students and others to kind of introduce them mm -hmm. to development. But it, it's not like a direct connection, I don't think, coming for a lot of kids straight out of school. And so for me, my pathway was working in that corporate environment for so long, I knew there were things that I wanted to push the envelope on, but they didn't fit the ethos of that organization. And I respect that. They, they have a path and a fund and investments that they're focused on, and they weren't necessarily aligned with where I thought there was an opportunity or a focus. And so for me, it was looking at, well, how do I activate the path that I see, very similar to you, like there's a niche and there's a problem and there's something to be solved. So how do you start to connect the dots to begin walking on that path? And um, I think one of the things that are really helpful are these kind of capacity building accelerators and programs because they do create some um, opportunities uh, to build support or networks mm -hmm. or resources. Um, for me coming in, it was 
having local advocates because we're working in a very, development is very local. Even if you're entering a new market, most developers will say they go find someone who is a local expert in something to be part of their team. So either that's your architect, civil engineer, someone on that team knows that market very well. And so for me, I was leveraging my resources, knowing Nashville the best. I was born there, I grew up there. I, I knew Nashville. I knew the partners and the players. And so to do that, it allowed me to, one, build credibility very quickly because people knew me and knew what I did and knew my background, but also it created a pathway for opportunities others didn't see. So it was working with those landowners that no one was talking to, mm -hmm. right? Because it sounded too hard to work with a faith-based organization to activate an underutilized land asset, yeah. or it was gonna take a lengthy conversation to work with a university or an HBCU to kind of walk through the path of what something could become. So it was seeing opportunities that maybe others weren't looking at or being a resource to people who didn't have an advocate or someone to connect with. Great. So I think that was helpful for me. Great. I'd love to stay on that, that topic of advocacy and, and the networks, the relationships. So Aisha, from your perspective, as, as you've guided through your own progression, uh, talk a little bit about you know, your experience there. Yeah, networks are incredibly important. I feel like um, from creating your team to trying to get something done through the district, whether it's permitting, I think you have to rely on your networks. I have learned really quickly that uh, it's better to go at it as a team for me. Um, it's a lot of moving parts with development. So getting involved with programs, um, subscriptions, I subscribe to a lot of different organizations so I can just get their information fed to me um, consistently. Um, going to uh, events that are talking about emerging technologies and things that we all are on a learning curve, um, AI being one, yeah. renewable energy being another, um, I've found really good, fruitful yeah. conversations and information in those spaces because we're all kind of hungry. It's new to most people, even if you've been in development for a while, using certain tools, it's we're all starting from the ground level. So I, I found some really good like networking opportunities in spaces where I learn, um, mm -hmm. and I, I would encourage that for sure. Great, wonderful. I'd love to, to round out this topic around progression, Ray, with, with your comments on not just progression, but also as we transition to a, a conversation around capital, right? And that's come up, but I think from your perspective of challenges and, um, and charting through those pivot points. Um, yeah, I would say that first off, I have a new architect we'll, we'll talk right. about. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and I feel like the price may be right. <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, but, but capital, I, I, you know, obviously, you know, some people, when you first go into real estate development, regardless if you come from a large firm or if you're starting off with small scattered site projects, I don't really think you understand the importance, and this is going to sound silly, but the importance of capital. Um, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of it that's required. Uh, it spends very fast during the pre-development period. Uh, and if you ask any lender it is, or any CDFI, it is the most riskiest part of the ecosystem and the life cycle of a development process. So, um, so you have to be strategic, obviously, as to uh, how you gain access or adjacency to capital. You know, one of the things that we did outside of the operating capital for our company was we partnered with um, a local, I won't say the name, but a local nonprofit community organizing entity uh, that had uh, 55 churches. Uh, and this was before you know, the, the, the rave of faith-based development initiatives. Uh, this was, as you just said, this was partnering with churches, yeah. right? This is a lot of, a lot of church dinners, um, <laughs> but, you know, but also a lot of direct conversations with um, pastors and senior leaderships of uh, one of the largest asset holders uh, in, in many, you know, many cities across the country, and especially in rural areas like South Carolina. It seems like everybody owns 40 acres. Um, and, and what we did was we, 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 we discovered whether or not their vacant or underutilized land could actually be transformed into a project. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the front end educating the leadership and the church body at some points on the nature, you know, uh, you know, what, you know let's be realistic, what to expect, uh, and then position ourselves to go out and find uh, a joint venture development partner. 
uh, at that point. Uh, but someone who, I won't go through the litany of requirements, but someone who probably most importantly was philosophically aligned mm -hmm. and was going to do the right thing mm -hmm. when you weren't around. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's huge. That's huge. Right? That'll end up, that'll, you, know, you could end up in the Washington Post if you get the wrong relationship, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then through that, uh, help them understand that we realize that you're bringing the, you know, the, the economic you know, base to the, to the project, the pre-development capital, you know, the balance sheet, uh, but, we, but we're bringing the land. Mm -hmm. and, and as a small black developer, uh, I was sitting right next to the pastor. I said, yeah, we're bringing the land. Right. Uh, and we worked our deal through that angle. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it took, obviously, it, it, it took quite a few projects to understand exactly what was important. Um, but it created, you know, what we like to call responsible revitalization because, you know, you're, most developers, there are very few, there's some phenomenal ones in D.C., uh, don't live in the communities that they develop, mm -hmm. right? So we're in Ohio now, South Carolina, uh, and I live in Prince George's County, so, and we're in D.C. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very respectful, I think, and conscious of mm -hmm. the community that you're going in to transform. You can't go in, you know, with the understanding mm -hmm. with your team that you've got the right idea for them. You know, that'll mm -hmm. get you sent out very quickly. Um, so, you know, in finding the capital creatively through a joint venture, uh, you do have to go in, um, you know, you can't have your hand and your mouth open. Mm -hmm. uh, you do need to go in and understand your value and be able to arm wrestle a little bit on what that means for both you as an entrepreneur as well as the client. And in our instance, uh, we were lucky enough to have enough pastors believe in us uh, through the faith-based development initiatives, even through this day. That's wonderful. Let's let's stay on the, the topic of joint ventures, right, and the, and the importance of those as a bridge to growth. Jennifer, if you could mm -hmm. just um, really kind of share some of uh, to what extent joint ventures have played a, mm -hmm. a role, um, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, those that are with established developers. Sure. Um, for me, it was what allowed us to become a developer because my background was in very large scale developments. Um, it sounds like you could easily transition down to smaller developments, but it was actually difficult for me because trying to figure out the right margins on a two or three unit development is a little challenging if you're coming from a 560 unit kind of mentality. So I kind of took what probably isn't the normal approach and I just jumped into big projects. But our first kind of a lot of our pipeline now is very large scale development because we're working with institutional partners who have a proven need or proven demand in the markets that they're in. And so we, very similar to Ray, we were looking for someone who could help blend in all those capital requirements, mm -hmm. right? There's some balance sheet commitments, there's certain liquidity, there's certain experience. We need all of those things to underwrite and finance a transaction. And so uh, one of our projects that we're super excited about is in the Nashville market. It's 254 units of active senior housing. Wow. So this is my first brand project out of the gate. And so there's not a lot of bankers who are going to talk to you and say, okay, now what have you done in the past? And you're like, <laughs> well, I used to work for this firm that did really big stuff. And they're going to be like, oh, maybe not so much. But what was helpful for us was finding that right JV partner. Yeah. Um, and what was very unique about our situation was we were able, through our capacity building programs, we had done the legwork. We had done the pre-development. We had done all the things. We had even applied for LIHTC and been awarded bonds. Mm -hmm. So we were at a position and a point where we were bringing a full package together, and mm -hmm. all I needed as a guarantor on a construction line huh. and someone who could demonstrate property management experience. So it changed the negotiation seat for our firm instead of being a minor player in a JV to being a significant equal partner in a JV opportunity. And so what was also important, though, was it gave us the leverage to pick the right partner. So I remember, um, <laughs> I remember a teammate saying, you just shopped a deal to four of the major LIHTC builders in our market, and mm -hmm. you picked one. Mm -hmm. Like, that is not a position someone who looks like me mm -hmm. is typically in. And so for us, that was a game changer for our firm because it allowed us to find the partner who had the right vision and values alignment to be that partner Absolutely. when we weren't at the table. So as I sit here today, they are in conversations with the church about land use and entitlements and kind of what layers we're adding to a very complex project. And I trust them to have that conversation without me. And there are not a lot of other developers that I could look at and honestly say that. Like, do I trust you to be sitting at that table when right. I'm not there? And so 
that was huge and very significant in kind of how we were able to grow. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from pivot, pivot points to leverage points. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful, uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, Leslie, from your perspective, I mean, wrapped up in this conversation of joint ventures, um, it's intertwined with capital, right, and some of the barriers. But if you could talk about how you see joint ventures playing into your, your firm's trajectory on some of the projects that you're currently working on. Certainly. Um, so we have been, our bread and butter has been 20 unit apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. We've done three of them uh, and finished and they're operating now. And we are starting three uh, as of the summer. So two demos already happened last week and I'm getting a call about the next one um, today. Uh, we have found a way to financially engineer and lever up and kind of hit all the, the important talking points to be able to do these 20 unit buildings. Um, and now we have a great team. So we have, uh, uh, we have a, our architect is a wonderful architect that, that we spun out a design business with. And uh, we also have a, a design and development analysis, uh, mm -hmm. analyst. We have a great construction manager. We have an accountant. We have a portfolio manager. We'll soon be bringing property management in-house because it turns out these scatter site uh, type buildings aren't um, really good fits for the property management in our area. It's either we do single family homes or we do 200 unit buildings, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. a bunch of 20 unit buildings, we, the numbers don't work for us. So anyway, so we're bringing that in house and we really got this 20 unit building thing uh, going, um, but we're designing 180 units right now and we have the land and we have, we've been through the first round of uh, design and the first round of permits. Um, and no showstoppers, which is great. Um, it, still using kind of the innovative intersection of those two codes that I was talking about earlier. Um, and we know that we can't ourselves uh, leverage up to do this 180 units. The, the financial engineering that we did to be able to do all these 20s, and, and we're going to continue to do 20s, but um, that would let us sign for it and guarantee it, and we meet all the equity requirements for the bank, it's not going to be there for the bigger bigger property. We're going to need an equity piece to come in and, and uh, to start the construction and get the construction loan. Um, so right now we're at a point where we're, um, we're at a great spot where we can go out and kind of court and find um, equity partners. We have not found one yet. Um, uh, it's, the project is great. It pencils for a for-profit with still maintaining a 20% of affordable units and 80% market rate. Um, and then or if we partnered with a nonprofit, uh, we could provide more units, more affordable units at deeper affordability. Um, so we'll see how this goes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. who knows? Maybe maybe there's a partner in the audience here or right. virtually. Yeah. So we, we've uh, wink, got a wink, big... anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as we come close to the Q&A portion in about 10 minutes, I'd, I'd love to, to, to wrap on the final two topics, which I believe are really intertwined. One is the intersection or interaction of, of government agencies and, and how your firms have, have leveraged, you know, and navigated some of the challenges and opportunities in unlocking, um, you know, land or, or interacting with governments. And the second part is around the importance of technical assistance, technical assistance programs, capacity programs. You all have touched on it a little bit, but let's start um, on the... Um, on, uh, on the government agency front. And Aisha, I'd love to, for you to kick us off in terms of some of those challenges and opportunities that you see uh, in working with government agencies. Sure. Um, challenges and opportunities. I would say uh, part of the challenge for me and sort of the people that I spend a lot of time with, it is needing technical assistance to go through the paperwork and the requirements. You may have a particular loan that has to meet the requirements of the government program. So this, the checks and balances of that, it takes a little time to get caught up, but it's not insurmountable. Um, opportunities, I think for me in the space of property management primarily and then emerging into development, I believe that government is yearning for solutions to how we will manage a small building up to our larger buildings that are serving and housing people who earn 30%, 50%, 60%. I think there sometimes are different needs that come with that. Um, it's a different attention that, that comes with that. 
trust is, is very important. Familiarity is important. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity for us to grow in that space, to contribute um, with my public service background. Uh, mental health is, is very important for us. And so I see an opportunity to um, not, not just address housing, but also some of the things that could help all of us mm. thrive, mm -hmm. you know, together. So more sustainable existence for me as the, the owner operator as well, because mm -hmm. um, it, it can it can be a, a bit much um, operating in um, certain communities that have seen scarcity. Yep. So. Um, Mindset training is important to us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're moving to a very uh, social, emotional space with the work that we're doing, and, and we're, we're excited about that. And, and I, I think government could use that. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Building off, off the topic of government, uh, Raymond, you, you've had a, a history in the public-private you know, sector that you shared earlier. Talk a little bit about you know what you see as some of the challenges and opportunities uh, and differences. You know. uh, sure. So, so my first so disclosure: my undergrad is in landscape architecture, and my master's is in planning. So, my first job was working for Montgomery County, Maryland, the Planning Commission, and I just happened to you know be sat down in the Development Review Division, and one of the first things that my mentor at that time said was. Um, you know, this is a public agency. You're here to serve the public, mm -hmm. and and they beat into me uh, just the culture of uh, government and municipalities. Um, you know, re regardless of its federal or local level, uh, they're there to help you be successful. Um, you know that there are rules that you need to abide by, but they're there to at its core to help you be successful. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I would encourage uh, young developers, aspiring, emerging, and even established is is to understand uh, the capacity and the opportunity with, with whatever agency uh, you're meeting with respectfully in the development process, whether it's planning, whether it's zoning, whether it's a, um, uh, an economic development entity, whether it's a housing authority. Uh, they all have different playbooks. And, uh, and I'm in the world of affordable housing or, uh, or workforce housing. And you have to find a way to creatively uh, stack, assess, and stack all of those different playbooks mm -hmm. as to what's going to make sense for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very lucky in D.C. as an example of an opportunity that they've done a pretty good job of creating what's called, I'll call it a super NOFA, Notice of Funding Availability, where rather than you know, go to five different agencies for uh, funding or resources to support a project, whether it's supportive services or actual dollars, you can go to the super NOFA and apply through that, which somewhat streamlines the process. But, but I would say that's still challenging in the world of affordable housing is, um, or, or subsidized or public-private partnerships is, is making sure that you're on the right timeline of the respective agencies. Mm -hmm. In the world of LIHTC, which is kind of where I play mostly, um, you know, you're looking at from start to close an 18-month window. And then you're looking at, depending on the size, if it's 250 units, you're probably looking at a 24 to 26-month construction cycle just before your product hits. You know, now, you know, we were doing the Heath tours uh, uh, because of Amazon and, and found, you know, 30,000 are needed here, 15,000 are needed here. Yeah. You know, by the time you come online, that number is has been exploded by then. Yeah. So um, to help governments and municipalities figure out a way to streamline, I'll call it an easy pass lane, mm -hmm. um, if, if projects are public, private, and supporting affordable, uh, to be able to get to market faster would be one of the things that I would say um, would be a challenge that I'd like to, to see overcome. Great. I love it. Easy pass lane. We'll, let's do it. Um, so as we wrap um, for the, the last uh, few minutes here, I'd love to kind of focus and land a plan around the effectiveness of technical assistance programs. I mean, this is a, a core of what um, what, uh, what we're talking about today. And, and, and Leslie, we'll start with you. But to what extent do the existing programs and maybe future programs, uh, how can they continue to support developers of color um, in the goals that, that you all are, are charting towards? Certainly, yeah. So um, we were chosen to participate in the um, Housing Equity Accelerator with Amazon and Lisk, mm -hmm. and um, received some really helpful um, training and um, and funding um, that progressed us from being kind of a group that does a bunch of projects to a business that 
looks at a structure and does a, a forecast and, and projects the cash flows and has employees and has salary payments and, uh, <laughs> and all that jazz. And it, it, it probably sped us at least two and a half, three times. And then also um, uh, with Enterprise, um, uh, um, they came in uh, with some financial help also to help us get spooled up and get our 20s going. So now our operation is, you know, we're doing four 20s a year. This year is three. We've got four lined up for next year. And we just want to do four 20-unit buildings until the market says no more. Um, in addition to our bigger stuff, and then also um, we're getting into the affordable townhome for sale business mm -hmm. also because it's, it's, a, it's a nice pivot from our 20-unit building. So um, uh, the, the support that we've received from, um, from Amazon, from Lisk, from Enterprise has been, has been huge for us and, and, um, and really helped us, and has really helped us get our, our 180 units um, uh, to where they are as fast as they have. Wonderful. Thank you. Jennifer, same question. Sure. I'm going to highlight some names you just heard. So right. I would say um, Amazon's Housing Equity Fund Accelerator accelerated us. It's why we exist while we're still here today, and Jennifer didn't have to fade out and find another corporate job to sustain her. <laughs> um, so I think, and also Enterprise as well. So Enterprise helped us with some flexible um, funding sources and things. And what I saw as the parallel between both of those organizations is their flexibility, right? Like they didn't take the super traditional, very structured approach to where they placed funds. Mm -hmm. They were willing to listen and hear the need and be adaptable. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge skill when it's someone who actually is holding purse strings. So um, that was a really important factor for us. And we also appreciated the support of Urban League of Middle mm -hmm. Tennessee, who provided us with that uh, network. So. Um, as you can imagine, if there's not a lot of developers that look like you, you need all the advocacy and support you can get. And they provided a really pivotal role in our community by being our voice and our advocate in spaces we couldn't be. Um, so that was really significant for us. I think their flexibility, the ability to adapt and listen and be innovative was very That's helpful. Great. Going on beyond traditional. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, Aisha. Yeah, I'll have to echo that. Um, our, the name of our program has fellowship on the end, um, Housing Equity Accelerator Fellowship. That's the most recent program I completed. I got my commercial start with the um, Equitable Development Initiative with Capital Impact Partners, who also is a part of the Housing Equity Accelerator Fellowship Program. So coming from the residential property management side, EDI, what we call it for short, that was my first introduction to commercial real estate. And it gave me all the basic tools that I needed to go forth. And then the Heath program, what we call it for short, then gave me the tools to really um, grow. And so here we are now. We're getting ready to have our ribbon cutting at the end of September for our first development, a nine unit with a wellness mm. space. Oh, all right. <laughs> And at the same time, uh, we're under construction with a four unit that we've owned since 2002. We're getting rid of our fuses. We're going to all electric. Another um, entity I would like to raise is uh, DCSEU, mm -hmm. DC Sustainable Energy Utility. I have gotten two certifications through them. I uh, lead green or lead two lead certifications, um, cost free training that has been very uh, beneficial, not just to my knowledge base, but again going back to turning your attention to the things that are emerging around us. So the lead certifications, while they're not new it seems like it's getting more attention. So sustainable housing, net zero, as DC moves toward that, we're all learning. And so uh, DC SEU has been a phenomenal um, resource. DC Green Bank has been, while they didn't necessarily provide technical assistance like EDI and the Heath program did, they were able to see me where I was as a public service worker trying to do more, um, a housing provider wanting to do more. And so I wasn't necessarily a business owner. I, I was a, a entrepreneur, um, mm. and I really had a job within, my, within the company. And so the technical assistance has allowed me to bring on other people to, to help with the portfolio. Enterprise has been phenomenal. Um, they were the reason why we were able to get our last acquisition mm -hmm. on May 1st. 
Um, and so, yeah, technical assistance is, is great. I Wonderful. grab hold of all the information that you can. It's, it's been a game changer. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So final words, Array, on the same topic before we open it up for, for questions. Sure. I mean, I, I, a lot's been said, but I can't say enough about um, uh, the Heath program that was kind of powered by Amazon. And I, we went through the Capital Impact Partners. I was one of the cohort members of Aisha. And uh, it was, you know, on three levels. One, the technical assistance was, um, was very well done and uh, curated to the needs of the participants. It actually became dynamic over the course of when we started versus when we ended. Uh, so they were listening and they heard us yeah. uh, as to what, what our needs were in real time, which doesn't happen in a lot of programs. Uh, but I think they had the flexibility to, to be able to do that. The second is, is that uh, Jennifer touched on this earlier. You know, real estate development is local. Uh, but for me, more importantly, it's also relationship based. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of information that goes between whatever that small circle is yep. in your respective markets mm -hmm. that you won't find in, you know, documents that are published. Mm -hmm. You know, they come through hard knocks. They come through mistakes. They come through, um, hey, let me show you something because I like you. Uh, and, you know, the Heath program allowed me to be in the room with uh, a series of mentors and industry experts that uh, I read about in the newspapers and may see it at events, but just to casually have conversation where they're open to uh, questions, um, you know, from a rookie, so to speak, uh, was phenomenal. And then the last piece, and I'll shut up, was uh, I had been doing real estate development uh, as an entrepreneur for uh, 15, no, 16 years and uh, gotten pretty good about negotiating strategic JVs that allowed me to continue to feed my family and go from project to project to project. Uh, but, but because of Amazon and the Heath program, it was the first time that I was able to have a conversation um, and negotiation with a joint venture partner and tell them that I was writing them, them a check, right. asking for their wire instructions <laughs> right. well, for $300,000. Uh, and that changed the conversation mm -hmm. immediately when we were talking about my percentage and my fee split. So, um, you know, that, that mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that's, uh, that was uh, a change of pace for me. Uh, and, it, and it showed me the other side, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it showed my partners the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's so. great. I mean, that's a beautiful transition of how there are multiple forms of capital, right, that can translate to financial capital, that relationship and network capital Absolutely. Uh, transforms. So I want to, uh, we've got five minutes for, for Q&A. There's one online, but I want to give the room, uh, those that are here in person, Live in the flesh, an opportunity if there are questions. Pardon me? Oh, they, oh, oh so all their questions are here. My apologies. So um, we'll go to the first one. Uh, Joanna Trotter, um, JPMC. Are there ways in which uh, you as developers are testing uh, new ways to avoid some of the pitfalls uh, that affordable housing owners are facing today um, around the rising costs, security, and lower rent performance? Uh, just curious. As those new to the field may be more nimble, you know, if you are testing approaches that control for these trends. Mm. Um, I would say I think as someone new, I learn from others. So I've been very um, adamant about focusing on what are the challenges across the industry, insurance costs mm -hmm. being a key driver to stopping affordable mm -hmm. projects before they start, and looking at uh, it's kind of to raise point, being in the room to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes leveraging my rookie hat to ask multiple people the, that question and getting kind of real-time insight has been very helpful um, to try to navigate through solutions that maybe um, even partners I would have JV'd with wouldn't have been aware of. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of leveraging that network of information to avoid some of those um, pitfalls. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I, I would just add that uh, the two things. Uh, one is on the creative joint venturing, but the other is in terms of cost is be conservative in your uh, underwriting, your personal mm -hmm. underwriting, before mm -hmm. it gets to the bank. Um, and you know, to show a little cushion in the event that things happen. Uh, again, the, the life cycle of a affordable housing project that requires multiple sources uh, is gonna have to withstand the test of time through many cycles throughout the year. Just because you're underwriting it at 3% now uh, doesn't mean in you know, 18 months it could be at 7%, mm -hmm. and then, then you've got no deal. Uh, the other piece is, um, we've been very successful uh, so far in three projects in South Carolina where our joint venture partner happens to be the general contractor. So um, I've gotten to see a different side of a GC, which is interesting, uh, as it relates to both costs, how the bidding's done, 
uh, and because they're also a co-developer, uh, they're willing to be a little you know, more tolerant on the amount of fee that they take, which should also help at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. I would like to add, um, we are taking a, an approach uh, to be more, to get closer to the community and to create more of a understanding and a perception that we're really in it together. The rent is what takes care of the asset. How can we create a relationship so that it's more seamless um, to where everybody understands their role? And so we're using our food access program um, for that. We have our first urban farm, Nettie Farm in Deanwood, where we have a volunteer program. And so sort of going back to my roots, being from D.C. and understanding a lot of the framework of our communities, I'm saying, hey, here we are together. We're, we're still here together. How can we cooperate um, and, and work together better? for a more sustainable future for, for all uh, stakeholders. So that's, that's been our approach, you know, really going closer to the community because that is where the money comes from. It's, it's circulating the dollars. So that's been our approach lately. Great. Uh, before we wrap, one more question. This is from Corey Lewis, uh, BKP. Uh, how does the uh, the current affordability housing crisis, affordable housing crisis, affect your firm's decision making process mm -hmm. when deciding what types of projects for to pursue in the future? Um, I think for our firm, it helped us to see that there was a need. So there's an ongoing need that we'll continue to seek to fill um, and look for creative ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps us take a very long term view on how we'll do that. So. We know that we'll be in this work for a while and kind of back to your community engagement approach. Mm -hmm. How are we building those long-term partnerships that can help address that need into the future? Wonderful. Um, when the stock market took a hit a couple weeks ago um, before it rebounded, um, one of the, the folks in the office said, hey, so does this affect anything we're doing here? Uh, you know, the stock market? And I'm like, uh, yes, <laughs> globally. <laughs> but more importantly, we know there's a need. So when we're dealing with risk or we're dealing with um, the perception of things going wrong or, or, or we're looking long term that, hey, what I do know, I don't know what the stock market is doing tomorrow. But what I do know is we need housing today. Mm -hmm. We need it yesterday and we're going to need it tomorrow. So um, that's, that's how we manage the ulcers that are generated, <laughs> the risk that we take. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I, I, we, we covered a lot today from, from trust to track record, uh, pivot points, leverage points, um, the importance of JV partnerships in, in really kind of progressing uh, through your path, and ultimately the importance of technical assistance uh, as, a, as a core foundation. So I just want to thank each of you uh, for sharing your perspectives and your, your experience with the audience. And with that, we will pass it to the next panel to deal with solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Give it up for panel one. Thank you, Tay. What an incredible session. Um, we're excited to follow on and see how mm -hmm. we can build out from there. So uh, I'm joined by a president and a deputy mayor, so <laughs> we are going to welcome them both to the stage. Um, I, I just, uh, rather than me doing a half good job, would you do a good job at telling us who you are, where you sit, and w what brings you to this work in specific, uh, sure. and how you're intersecting? And we'll just start with uh, Lori, we'll go to Kenya. So I'm going to first say that I was told that my cataracts are not good enough to have removed, so the bright lights are a lot. <laughs> so if I close my eyes, it's because the lights hurt. So I put that out there, not because I'm asleep. Um, so I'm Lori Chapman. I am the president of Enterprise Community 
uh, Investment, which is the division that manages the capital for Enterprise Community Partners. Enterprise Community Partners is a large national nonprofit. Uh, you heard a number of folks speak uh, on the panel beforehand about the efforts that we've done to support developers of color, both emerging as well as what we call uh, those that are a lot more advanced uh, in the work, but potentially new to hanging out their own shingle. So uh, on an overall basis, uh, my, my platform of, cap of the capital division, we manage about $20 billion using low-income housing tax credits. We have a CDFI, new markets tax credits, as well as a private equity real estate fund um, with regard to that group. And then we have a mortgage company where we partner um, uh, to deliver agency debt, Fannie, Freddie, insurance companies, uh, and others. And then there's another component just to finish out the thread. We also have a development arm, and that development arm is a fairly large developer here in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, through that unit, we uh, own roughly 16, mm, sorry, 14,000 uh, units of affordable housing from a very small sliver of Pennsylvania down into um, the Tidewater area of Virginia. Uh, so we both develop and own and operate with responsibility to about 23,000 residents. And then we have another group that works largely with state, local uh, government on policy issues affecting affordable housing, uh, as well as with stakeholders uh, in those communities. And we have offices in 12 major metros around the city, mm -hmm. uh, country, excuse me. And I know this work is near and dear. This particular work <laughs> in terms of um, uh, the, what we talk about is our equitable path forward uh, is near and dear to me. Uh, mm -hmm. It is something that my colleagues entrusted me to manage for the organization where we committed to leverage three and a half billion dollars uh, into uh, developers mm -hmm. of color using each one of those platforms, both in terms of a growth fund. Um, you heard folks talk about technical assistance I've been very resistant to call it, it technical assistance or cap capacity building mm -hmm. because a lot of the developers that we work with, quite frankly, uh, and I keep wanting to say Norm Nixon, but it was Raymond Nix. Uh, I don't know why <laughs> Norm Nixon sticks in my head. I'm a basketball person. Um, but uh, as, as, as Raymond pointed out, mm -hmm. that part of what we did in our stepping back to look at this is assess ourselves and mm -hmm. what we were doing that was not necessarily creating capital products that were accessible. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he mentioned that we began to say that we needed to take a look at is, you may not come with your own portfolio, but you for 12 years, 15 years, have been working and delivering large projects. We need to recognize mm -hmm. that experience. Uh, and in so doing, it's not TA or capacity building you need, it's advisory services you need, mm -hmm. like any owner, uh, of a business, and Jorge, I appreciate uh, saying that real estate development is a business. It's not just the business of real estate. Uh, and having those advisory services mm -hmm. to help and assist you as you think about growth and how you grow, where you grow, and the kind of capital you need to be able to do so. So, I like to coin that um, because I also have challenges with saying technical assistance or capacity building or capacity building yes. because it it insinuates that people are coming from a place of lack exactly um, exactly that wasn't structurally put in place exactly and and to, and for many reasons to no fault of their own right um, so good afternoon everybody um, my name is Kenya Merritt I am the deputy mayor of economic development for the city of Chicago um, and I am charged with driving economic growth for the third largest city um, in the U.S. Um, and I do that through partnering with eight different city departments and affiliates, um, of which that includes the built environment, the Department of Planning and Development, which houses also our zoning and land use department, um, the Department of Housing, which is responsible for driving housing development largely focused on affordable housing, um, public housing, as well as arts and culture and tourism and business development and a whole host of other things. Um, and so what brought me to this work is, um, is who I am um, as a resident of Chicago, born and raised um, on Chicago's west side, North Lawndale community, currently live in Austin. And those of you that know about Chicago know that it is 
a very segregated city. It is a city that um, deals with racism and a, a history of segregation that um, was brought about by the government um, through housing covenants, covenants as well as redlining. And so when we look at our neighborhoods in Chicago, those historical policies are perpetuated by the disinvestment that happens on our south and our west side. And so what brought me to this role is to be in a position to reverse that. Love it. So we're going to jump into our questions. Uh, and we heard in the first panel from developers about what they feel they need to succeed. We heard, uh, I, I loved the diversity of pathways that they took mm -hmm. to get to where they are at the moment, as, as well as where they're going. It's, it's hard to imagine two sectors more important to developer success than local government and finance. And mm -hmm. so that's why we wanted you all on the panel. Um, and so I, I wonder if we could start maybe with government and we can think through what are the ways uh, that you see that local government can help or hinder multifamily development? Now, in general, um, mm -hmm. And then maybe also if we can add that, what, how does it filter to specific uh, for developers of color? Does it look any different um, yeah. in that way? So, King, if we could start with you. Yeah, so I think about that in two ways. Certainly from the help component um, in terms of making sure that we have um, the proper processes and protocols in place to ensure that development is happening in a safe way. Um, that renters or homeowners are getting products that are safe and sustainable. On the other side of that, I think that government certainly has played a role historically um, with hindering development. Um, you know, one of the things that was impressed upon me when I started in this role was that we need to move quicker, that it takes too long for development to happen in the city of Chicago. When you look at our community areas on our south and our west side, we have a significant amount of vacant lots. We have commercial corridors that require investment, but we're not at a lack of developers and people that want to do good work. But what government has traditionally done in the past, in some ways, has unintentionally put up roadblocks. Um, so one of the first things that um, Mayor Johnson and our economic development team put together was this initiative called Cut the Tape. Um, and it started with an executive order coming from the mayor saying we need to get out of the way. We want development to happen in our neighborhoods. We want transformation to happen across the entire city. Well, then we need to figure it out. And so there are 13 city departments that are involved in the development process in Chicago, all play a role in getting shovels in the ground. So we called them to the carpet and said, look at your processes. There are some things that you're doing, you've been doing for the, for the sake of just doing it because it's just been on the books for 20, 50 years. Let's start to think through what are some of the things that are critical and what are some of the things that are not. Um, and we pulled together um, developers, syndicators, CDFIs, and external folks that are part of the development process to figure out what are the pain points from their perspective as well. And we've put together this report. For those that are interested, it is online. Tonight you can read it, light reading. <laughs> it is amazing for those that are, that are interested. But we had over 100 recommendations around what we could do to streamline the process but we wanted to go a step further. We put together a task force of about 40 people that are comprised of the development community, again, CDFIs, all people that are involved in the development process to hold us accountable, but also to get involved in the work of making those processes um, easier and quicker. And so we recognize that time is money, and for us to say that we want development to happen, and that we're pro-development, city that we want to support emerging and diverse developers, we need to be able to make sure that they're able to do their work quickly. And so we've come up with some really cool initiatives so far um, that we've been able um, to implement. One is that we're hoping to be the first major city um, to eliminate parking minimums. 
And so for those that know about parking minimums, you know that a parking space can cost on average between $25,000 to $65,000 a spot. As we start to think about um, transportation nodes throughout the city, where we have development that is happening along transportation nodes, we don't necessarily need that, that amount of parking. Um, another initiative that's coming out of our Department of Planning in terms of supporting emerging developers and making development happen quicker is what can the city do in terms of making land that we own clean and available and pad ready for developers to just come in and just build up. And so where we can help with remediation, cleaning the site, covering those costs, um, and cleaning the title, we want to be able to do that so that we can get develop development done quicker. It does feel like we're having collectively this yes in my backyard moment mm -hmm. that can help. Uh, how about, from your perspective, Lori, about the government role? And you see it, I'm sure, in every project you're trying to underwrite. Well, it's interesting because I feel like you just said everything that I was going to say. I'm sorry. Right? <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I will go back again to something that was said on the first panel because I liked the terminology because it made it clear. And it was like the easy pass, right? Mm. And so for us, collectively, we talk about it, and hopefully this was in some of those recommendations, having a managed pipeline. Mm. And the managed pipeline essentially means if you get one major piece of funding, that triggers yes. a lot of the next set of funding such that you, you're, you're not having to start over and start over and start over. And it begins to compress what is this fairly long, you know, somebody spoke about it being 18 month process, just mm -hmm. to get all of the capital together mm -hmm. where you've had one part of the same government give you the go, and then there's another part that challenges you on yeah. half of the things that the other department has already signed off on. So by doing that, and then having what we talk about as a clear and understandable affordable housing financing system, mm. right, which is what you talked about, that allows capital to flow easily. Mm -hmm. Because I now, as a, quite frankly, risk taker, right, have an understanding of, where I'm taking that risk and how I mitigate it. That is huge in terms of our ability to be creative, mm -hmm. our ability to be innovative and think about new products, uh, particularly when we do it in tandem with all of the parties you just spoke about. Yeah. And I think I'll just double down on that, the predictability. Yes. Right? Critically in, important. Yes, in terms of when doors are opening and ribbons are cutting, but particularly that's important on the front end of a project when you're trying to obtain capital. Exactly. Yeah. And there was one, just to, one, again, person on the earlier panel uh, indicated knowing what that looks like. So there was mm -hmm. one city for, again, us as underwriters. What we learned is that from the time you put in your application for housing credits, you were going to go through two cycles before you got approved. But that was okay because it became predictable, right. so I could provide you with pre-development financing, mm -hmm. know how long it was going to be outstanding, and what you should be accomplishing in that time period, because that was what the cycle was for that locality. Time is literally money when yes. it comes yes. to development. Exactly. So those, mm -hmm. those, that attention. Let's talk about the money side of things. Um, and you know, we've, we've shown the spotlight on government. Now let, okay. let's show it on the financier. So we've done a load of interviews across all our studies. And you know, people will wax uh, on and on about how important it is. And yet, there's also no shortage of challenges that uh, we hear about. And um, you know, we hear it even about CDFIs sure. and special equity funds, but certainly we hear it about mainstream bank debt, but we hear it about private equity. Mm -hmm. We hear it all the way mapping up to pension funds. I mean, there's so much that goes into it mm -hmm. that really comes together as a challenge. And so maybe, Laura, if we could start with you, just paint a picture of that broader ecosystem, if you will, what kind of money are we talking about? Where do you see the challenges from the type of money, but also maybe by type of developer, more aspiring, mm -hmm. more emerging, more mm -hmm. established? I'm sure differences in terms of market rate versus affordable. Mm -hmm. If you could just lay out that general landscape and then we'll dig in a little more. Sure, so within that landscape specifically of capital providers, right? think of your CDFI as your early stage financing most of the time. 
right? We like to think of ourselves as the but for capital. Mm -hmm. And that means we're coming in early. It's at a stage where the, the project is, the concept is well conceived. The likelihood of it being financeable has been decided. And now you need that early investment to begin to come in. Look at that capital as being potentially anywhere from 12 to 36 month kind of capital in terms of getting through that stage. Uh, and, and that's pre-development money? Or? That, that's generally going to be pre-development and acquisition capital, right? We're typically not going to be your large-scale construction financier. Mm -hmm. That's not the role of CDFIs, uh, typically. Do we do some construction financing? Yes, particularly when it comes to mod rehab. If we're coming in on an acquisition and there are immediate health and safety needs, we're going to want to take care of that and we'll finance that. But we're not typically financing ground up, you know, mm -hmm. four or 500 unit kind of developments. Maybe a 20 unit development, maybe, depending on size and scale uh, and the level of equity that can be brought to the table. So then you're going to need to go to that construction financing. As part of that construction financing process, they're going to want to know what's your takeout, what's your perm, right? And that's where government comes mm -hmm. in, particularly if it's an affordable development that's seeking some level of subsidy using low-income housing tax mm -hmm. credits, home dollars. There are lots of other programs that also support um, uh, uh, affordable housing development, if you will. And then the next phase is that permanent financing. There's agency debt. Agency debt is typically... Fannie Freddie is what we, when we think about that. So being able to have a relationship with a mortgage financing company. And the part that I left out is the most critical part that you also need at the beginning, but it's the hardest to get, which is the equity, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so equity is literally the most critical piece of the capital stack. But if you're an emerging developer, that's like the, the, the type of capital you are least likely to have. So sweat equity becomes important. But that's also where a lot of developers, uh, newer developers, get their start is in using low-income housing tax credits because it brings that subsidized equity that's very regimented but mm -hmm. nevertheless helps you in terms of getting that start. So th those are kind of the different pieces and construct. What do I think is most important for the developer to bring to the table as part of that? Um, the, the most important thing for us is making sure that we can understand your financial track record. If you don't have a financial track record, help us understand your experience. Help us understand what other expertise and resources that you bring to the table. Part of our Equitable Path Forward initiative was, in fact, again, looking at non-traditional types of equity. And so some of that, quite frankly, is community equity, right? We would look mm -hmm. at groups and say, you've been operating in this neighborhood for 20 or 30 years. That lot of land has been blighted for the last 25. You are the one who brought it to this point of development. Why should we mm -hmm. now force you, and this is another mm -hmm. place where government can come in, force you to partner in a way where it is extractive with regard to the development fee? So how does mm -hmm. government support those community organizations staying in but also protect its interests right. in terms of making sure that the development can mm -hmm. occur, um, but also, again, give some of the economics to that sweat equity because sweat equity okay. has real value and it should be uh, included in the proposition of what is equity for that development. As a CDFI, I am non-regulated, I can say that. The banks <laughs> are regulated. They cannot. The pension funds have a responsibility to their pensioners, and I respect that responsibility to, the, to those pensioners. At the same time, there, I think, is an opportunity for pension organizations to look at a portion of its portfolio for the better societal return on investment, right? Those pension dollars are often the dollars of the folks, like they will say, in New York City, most of the people who live in NYCHA housing are New York City employees, mm -hmm. right? Should those people not have a say in how their pension dollars support their life today and into the future? And if we could figure out an opportunity to do that, where we are mindful of the responsibility for our future, but also being thoughtful about how we can make investments today, I think mm -hmm. that would be a great opportunity for us to start doing. Yeah, and I'll just add that on something that she mentioned earlier, there is a role for government to play in terms of capital and um, 
being able to support a pipeline of emerging and diverse developers. So to your point, with LIHTC funds as well as with other sources that we leverage to be able to, to do housing in what we call our high target areas, like we have the ability to develop procurement right. in a way where we can target people that are from the community that look like the community that we want to develop. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about our Cut the Tape initiative, but over the past 15 months, we've also been thinking about the way that we structurally fund development. We've used tools in the past that had been rigid um, and inflexible and unpredictable. Um, over the past couple of months, we just recently passed the $1.25 billion bond program that gives us the ability to split, split that in half between housing to go towards developing additional housing units, um, and then the other half towards our Department of Planning and Development to do commercial development as well as support business development. But what that has given us is greater flexibility to be able to be in this capital space. Mm -hmm. And so now we're looking at um, setting up um, initiatives that allow for us to provide support in terms of pre-development. Um, we have an amazing um, philanthropic arm in Chicago that piloted a pre-development fund. Mm -hmm. So for folks that in the past panel that talked about the need for those pre-development dollars, whether you're using it for an architect or you're using it to do your financial modeling, like those dollars are needed. And typically when you're coming into a deal with the city, we were just giving you the, the money for the construction and not the pre-development. But they've been able to do a, a proof of concept. And now we understand we have these flexible dollars that gives us the ability to be able to support pre-development. But also we're looking at how do we work alongside CDFIs to also do a little bit more riskier yeah. um, lending. And so is there a way for us to provide a loan loss reserve where if you, for example, loan a million dollars, we'll come in and provide 250000 so that you can be able to underwrite maybe somebody that wouldn't normally be able to access capital in your traditional institutions. And DC had, um, through its site acquisition fund initiative, a similar method where mm -hmm. we could go in and, for example, fund beyond what would typically be your LTC or loan to cost or loan to value because we mm -hmm. had that kind of risk waterfall risk sharing mm -hmm. um, of local government the state committed. And I would be remiss if I didn't also mention something that I think has been good uh, for Chicago and the state of Illinois is you guys look at your qualified allocation plan mm -hmm. to make it more um, uh, open to looking at, mm -hmm. again, the different capacity uh, or capability sets, if you will, of developers at different stages. And that's also huge, right, yeah. in terms of really creating more opportunity for um, uh, emerging developers mm -hmm. to, in fact, get into to this space. So I kudos on that. Thank that you. That was a big deal. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it for our team <laughs> back home. A, a shout out to our commissioner, um, Sierra Boatwright, who leads planning and development, and um, Commissioner Lissette Castaneda, who leads housing. But you're absolutely right. Um, for us, our economic development team is comprised of those two amazing women and then myself. And so when you think about the work and the impact of what we have the ability to do, you have women that are from these community areas in Chicago that are dying for development. And you have people sitting in seats that are looking at the work through that lens of how do we ensure that we're creating an ec ecosystem that reflects the diversity of our city. Love it. And we've seen some CDFIs do pre-development line of credits. We've got mm -hmm. the loss reserves. We've got some tools in place. We may mm -hmm. need to blow them up and widen them yes. out. But, but we're, we're moving in those directions. Mm -hmm. I, I keep hearing things a little bit more on the affordable side than the market mm -hmm. rate. And yeah. I'd love just to double dip on the market rate. And if you see some of the how the challenges are different or similar with respect to some of the financing access and, mm -hmm. and some of the tools that are available or might work in that context. Yeah, so then let me know if I'm not answering your question specifically. For us as an organization specifically, we work with developers that we define as mission aligned, right? Mm -hmm. And our mission is about developing affordable housing. And affordable for us, uh, and I'm assuming a lot of housers in the room or on the phone, really is defined as anything from, you know, um, uh, 
uh, very low income, extremely low income, really up to workforce, where we will do up to 120%, sometimes higher um, uh, area median income if we're working with local mm -hmm. government with regard to that. And part of that is being driven by where we get our capital from, mm -hmm. quite frankly, yep. right? And so most CDFIs or intermediaries are capitalized by financial institutions mm -hmm. through their Community Reinvestment Act. Mm -hmm. We're also capitalized by philanthropy who through their um, requirements also have a lens towards being able to support folks who are generally uh, defined as economically disadvantaged uh, in some way, shape, or form. So that informs how we uh, can use our financing, um, if you will. With regard to, therefore, the market rate, some of these program and programmatic opportunities are not necessarily available, but what we try to do, for example, through Equitable Path Forward is look at it through a lens of saying, but will this have benefit to the community writ large, and therefore can we carve out some portion of our commitment under that to support market rate? And then what's market rate? Am I going up to luxury class A? No, but you know, market rate that may be at a 200% AMI may be within reach, particularly if it's mixed income, right? Or if it's a mixed use development that somehow again brings other important amenities to a community. So it's harder for me to, to say what we can do because we can't do very much just given the nature of our capital. Yeah. Yeah. City similar, you think? It's most engaged on the affordable side? Yeah, so here's the thing. For us, you know, the market rate is happening in Chicago. Um, what we're trying to do is make sure that there are still options for affordability. Um, we recently announced a project along LaSalle Street um, where we had a significant amount of vacancies in our what was our former financial district. We're not at a loss of folks that want to, you know, transform commercial spaces and readapt it in, into market rate housing. But for us, we want to make sure that we have units that are earmarked and set aside for affordability. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely the need on that side. In mm -hmm. our data, we looked at a split. This is not analogous, but a slip, split for for-profit and non-profit. Definitely saw more representation of people of color and also women in the uh, non-profit profit. spaces mm -hmm. than the for-profit. And I'm, I'm guessing if we do that look by affordable market. And when you say meaning what type of development they're doing, is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. I want to hear from you briefly on, um, on networks, on connectivity, um, we've talked about money. We've talked about government. What else needs to be done to make the boxes that Jorge showed not look like that when we come back together in I don't know how many years and have this same conversation and say we made progress? Uh, is it mentoring? Is it coaching? There aren't enough CDFIs in every location. There's not there. enough <laughs> philanthropy. <laughs> uh, um, you know, not every local government is engaged on these topics. Not every yeah. state government is engaged on these topics. Not every housing finance agency. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think needs to be done among developers? What do you think needs to be done among these other nodes of influence that can push us forward? Yeah, I think someone touched on it in the earlier panel that, like, the sector is very relational, right? Mm -hmm. And so w when you have the networks, when you have the relationships, it makes it a little bit easier um, to do development. I think for us in Chicago, um, certainly strengthening the ecosystem um, is a role that we can, we can play. Um, there are a number of things that we're doing to help support that, and there are things that are just happening organically. I think one of the things that Jorge um, mentioned in his opening is that there is a group of black developers in Chicago that has, have built like a strong connection. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're doing an amazing job with ensuring that like they're supportive of one another and that they're sharing information. You have those that are more seasoned and those that are younger that are coming along. Um, and so the relationship between uh, the, the black developers in Chicago, I think, can essentially serve as a model maybe for, for other, other cities. But in terms of what we can do, you know, some of the things that, that we've started to support is trying to make sure that we're giving funding to um, emerging developers to be able to make those connections with architects, with um, advisory services. 
um, that they don't necessarily have to, to look for funding outside of, um, of the city to do that, but that we can help to support those efforts in making the connections. Um, we have to also walk a fine line being government, mm -hmm. but what we can do is provide the capital so that they can be able to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And for us, uh, so there were three kind of components to our equitable path forward. There was a capital component where there was a growth fund. We said we'd raise $350 million to invest. We, in fact, raised $445 million uh, at the last check because that's how much funders believed in us and we believed in it. We raised uh, capital for to provide the capacity um, uh, of advisory services or to mm -hmm. provide advisory services capacity both to our internal team but also finding third-party resources, right? Mm -hmm. And within that, um, we created um, what we're calling our peer network. And the purpose mm -hmm. of that peer network is, quite frankly, to bring those developers who are participating in our equitable path forward together for those kind of learning mm -hmm. opportunities. And the win-win for us is when they start JVing, right? Mm. And so that to us has been incredibly important and an outcome that we're really excited about are seeing developers of color JVing with each other um, and being that network mm -hmm. and being that support uh, in a way that is um, great for them, great for the community, uh, we believe. And then the third component um, that gets uh, often not talked about, but there's a young man here today who participates in it, um, and I often say is I think the legacy of what EPF should be uh, is what we call our real estate analyst training program. Mm -hmm. And that is a program where we are taking, um, we learned our lesson, they need to be graduate students because we're better at that than undergraduates, uh, students who come in for two years. And because Enterprise literally has every component of community development and real estate under one roof, where else we felt better than to begin to seed opportunities mm -hmm. for young people who are interested in and know about, mm -hmm. as well as those who don't know about. Jennifer mentioned, not a lot of times you wake up saying, I want to be a developer, right? Because you don't really know what that is or what that means. And so in that two-year program, you rotate across the organization to learn about mm -hmm. the capital products and get those hard skills that, quite frankly, are the necessary components to being either a financier or a developer, mm -hmm. right? So there's no expectation that you have to stay with enterprise, um, if you will, and that you have to be on the finance side. What we want to see is, in the way that I talk about it, is basically changing the complexion of real estate mm -hmm. uh, and making sure that we start doing that with folks at a younger and an earlier age uh, to be able to do so. And that's on the lending side as well as on the... We're expanding it to the to the other components now, right? It started where you come in through the CDFI, you can rotate through the housing credit, through the development business, through the asset management business, which is incredibly important uh, part of this. How you raise capital, right, and go out and talk to the institutional investors uh, to be able to attract capital, both for our work, but in that process, you're learning about what the key trigger points mm -hmm. are for them when you go in and talk about capital. And so I'm hearing that there are some solutions that we can think about that will port reasonably well-ish across markets. Mm -hmm. But real estate is also such a local business. And mm -hmm. while, of course, there are developers who work across markets, mm -hmm. a larger share than other sectors of work is done locally. And mm -hmm. so the Chicago model can be an example, but Gary, Rockford, mm -hmm. Milwaukee, it's yeah. they, it, it's different folks, mm -hmm. and we're going to need solutions in all of the markets, mm -hmm. and so it's going to just be some work, mm -hmm. but okay. It's going to be exciting work. Like, I think we have the bones, right? Like, you know, what I, what I heard and what you brought up, and I appreciate you doing that, is a couple of years ago, the city did a racial equity assessment, essentially looking mm -hmm. at how we let funding for development. Um, and the chart that Jorge showed is indicative of what's been in place for decades, right? Um, when we looked at how we would let grants for LIHTC, like the way that it's structured and it's so layered and challenging, mm -hmm. it's just mostly non-diverse developers that would be able to access those dollars. And so post-racial equity assessment, we're starting to see a significant 
amount of younger, emerging, diverse developers of color now doing these projects in our neighborhoods. I think we're at about 47% um, in terms of developers of color on our housing projects, um, and probably similarly on the planning side. And so when we think about those other cities or even regionally, some of the things that we can do is like, everyone should be looking at how they're procuring, procuring developers mm -hmm. um, in their respective cities. The other thing that I talked about earlier is just processes. Like, how are we unintentionally maybe sometimes making it difficult for emerging developers that don't have the capital to wait when we make processes so long? And then also our advisory services. We're going to get away from technical assistance yes. and capacity building. Yes. How are we making sure that for, for some of our younger developers that we're, we're making sure that they have the funding as well as connecting them to the resources to be able to navigate the real estate system? Because sometimes it can be confusing. And I think that government plays a role in that. Like mm -hmm. We have the ability to be able to support um, in a way that maybe others can't in building that pipeline. Sneak in your questions. We're going to go through some audience Q and A here. So, um, but it, it, I've spent much of the past year interviewing chief procurement officers in cities. Oh, fun! Yeah, uh, <laughs> fascinating. I mean, talk about important, but not highly visible yeah. um, beyond their immediate space. And it, those interviews were not specific just to real estate development, mm -hmm. but they obviously are very pertinent mm -hmm. when we're talking about land disposition and the like. And um, the changing legal environment mm -hmm. uh, is changing. Mm -hmm. And so we had uh, not just the SBA 8A case. Mm -hmm. We had the MBDA case. Um, we had a, a local case against Houston. Um, you know, we've had now the Fearless Fund case. Mm -hmm. And not all of these settled being appealed, being worked out, some of them. But it is also very clear that we are likely in a legal environment where targeting public sector mm -hmm. resources and even private sector resources on the basis explicitly of race is not going mm -hmm. to stand. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've come out with a paper that articulates a number of things from the public procurement perspective um, that nevertheless actually can advance some of our equity goals. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just would be interested to hear how much you think, um, you know, as you're thinking about even internal to CDFI, mm -hmm. but then also in the public sector, um, you know, things like local preferences mm -hmm. or emerging or things tied to the stage of the developer or the net worth of the developer um, or things that are you know, um, just uh, incorporating other um, ease of business solutions, you know, even in some spaces, you know, paying people on time uh, mm -hmm. can make a huge difference to the mm -hmm. ability to uh, enter into uh, a marketplace or not. Um, so in this, in, in this current legal environment, I um, just would love any reflections that you have from your different spaces about how to continue to advance the work. So I think for us, to that point, when we stepped back and looked at our underwriting, my question to the team was, where are we saying no and why? Mm. And where, when we stepped back and looked at that, again, to your point, it was because we were holding ourselves um, uh, to a set of criteria, quite frankly, that was being used by banks and large regulated institutions of, you know, kind of, when you look at models, it's like, well, we want to see a million dollars of liquidity and five million dollars of capitalization. Real estate is a capital intensive business. In my more years than I care want to say, I have never seen those two things, quite frankly, be the defining factor as to whether or not a project succeeds or fails. If a project gets in trouble, whether that developer comes to the table helping you work it out or not. None of that matter in terms of it. And so it was getting beyond those and using those as criteria versus just saying, right, yes, we are targeting what I, what I now try to talk about in our organization, developers of color or other historically marginalized populations, right? And how does that show up for us? Because capital typically is a challenge. But capital could be a challenge for somebody 
from rural Appalachia, right? And we should look at that, right? That that is a factor that says, okay, this is a historically mar marginalized population. How do we use these tools to be able to support those kinds of developers also? Yeah, and I would just add, not, you know, doubling down certainly on the tools and processes for governmental entities, um, but also going back to procur procurement. And that's always a fine line um, with the public sector. So, for example, with one of our grant programs, we look at or we give bonus points for people that come from high target community areas. Mm -hmm. Like, are you from this area? Do you live in this area? Then that's a preference okay. for us. Question from the audience is about guarantee requirements or guarantor uh, impact type of the developments came up in panel one. Um, and wondering about any solutions that you can envision from philanthropy, government, mission finance broadly um, on guarantors. Anything you're seeing there, Laura, you're thinking about? So I can speak for my organization specifically, again, as part of our equitable path forward effort. Um, one of the um, opportunities is for us to provide what we call a standby guarantee facility. So again, for a developer that doesn't present with what a institutional regulated uh, inv investor needs, um, we will use our balance sheet to stand behind that developer to the extent we are working uh, on that project with you, either by being the syndicator of mm -hmm. low-income housing tax credits or if we're using our private equity real estate fund, right, where we are literally delivering private equity um, to the deal and for, for whatever set of reasons, um, and it's not any, they're very specific things, we will say enterprise will stand behind that developer for operating deficit guarantees, potentially to get the bonding uh, for, for um, a project, uh, certain key factors that are critical but again, may not be capitalized sufficiently to be able to, to meet the requirements of those institutions. Right. So that's one of the things. If I'm not mistaken, New York City has looked at a similar such program. Mm -hmm. I believe Philadelphia has looked at a similar such program through one of their government agencies mm -hmm. to be able to provide those kind of guarantees as well. OK. All right, we got ideas to take yes. back. Um, and I want to talk about our current rate environment. If I have any abiding, uh, it's that we've got all our solutions lined up, and it is a you know swimming upstream sort of thing right now. And so, how much of this is going to change? You know, on Friday, um, <laughs> with the Fed meeting, and uh, no, not not needing you predict the future, but just contextualize all of this work in this current moment, if you would, for us. I'm not sure I understand. So what's yeah. the question? The question <laughs> is, how are things going out there? Uh, it's, it's rough <laughs> right now. It's, it's, right now. It's, it's, it's a difficult environment, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like who, I, I won't kid you in saying that there are very large, very well-known developer partners who are struggling. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with interest rates, by and large, mm -hmm. right? It has a lot to do with the environment coming out of COVID, mm -hmm. right, where inflation, supply chain issues caused by, or inflation that was caused by the supply chain issues, the cost of construction, quite frankly, just operating expenses uh, for the development projects. One of the other things that we're seeing, one of the biggest, two big challenges, so there's insurance, but quite frankly, then in a lot of our urban areas, um, a lot of our developer partners are basically having to fund many police forces because the level of law enforcement needed uh, in some of these communities is inadequate and there is a responsibility to those residents. Those are costs that were not underwritten at the level that mm -hmm. they are beginning to actually experience. Mm -hmm. So while interest rate environment triggers in terms of new development in certain ways, government and other sources mm -hmm. have solved for that. And so mm -hmm. forward committed mm -hmm. low-income housing tax credit allocations mm -hmm. to solve problems. So we'll see a little bit of a slowdown we're predicting in 24 and 25 as, prior, as forward uh, allocations were used to solve problems in 22 and 23, right? 
So there's that aspect of it. And then with regard to rates, we always we look for other subsidies. We reimagine the project. We value engineer. Some mm -hmm. of that you can't get around. Mm -hmm. There's now coming out, uh, 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 Aisha talked a lot about um, uh, uh, climate-based funding, if you mm -hmm. will, green banks and so forth. We're now looking at that as another opportunity to help solve uh, for problems and gaps uh, in new development. Mm -hmm. And so that should not be ignored, but also don't see it as a panacea, right? It's going to add some costs, but hopefully create better operating properties uh, in the long term and certainly have implications for our climate mm -hmm. environment um, that are positive. Yeah, and I would just add, this is where I think um, creative funding comes into play. Certainly we've seen it on deals that the city is funding where the cost of construction over the past couple of years has skyrocketed. And so folks are value engineering projects um, that we're still trying to get across the finish line. But in terms of the creativity around funding, certainly like funding related to sustainability and environment um, is helpful. But I think there's an opportunity, and I'm not just saying this because I'm at the local level, but for our friends at the state and federal oh, level, <laughs> <laughs> to come alongside us and to be a little bit more creative and flexible and flexible in the type of funding that they provide um, for development and for housing. Uh, I'm going to sneak in one quick question before we wrap because okay. uh, we didn't totally touch on this yet from the audience, but talk a little bit about outreach and engagement. Mm -hmm. How do you find developers? How do you find the ones that are ready for the kind of support that you're needing? And how do you build, cultivate? How do you build trust? Yeah. Uh, that's probably a whole conversation. It is give, a whole give conversation. Give us the highlight. Yeah, just very high level. So some of the things that we do in the city is that we have several, um, several verticals in terms of development. We have programs that focus on single family homes and two or three flats. Um, through Rebuild, where we're providing support to um, some of our smaller developers to get like their toes wet with development. And it ends up being a win-win for us because we know that those folks will hire people from the community as well as build the community. Um, and then we help and support them to the point where they're doing, you know, mega developments or large developments or are part of JVs. Um, and so certainly I think that like, there's a role not only for us, but again, for our partners at the state and the federal government to look at like how we're supporting the building and the development of a pipeline of diverse developers to, to go along to be able to, to be able to do these multi um, multifamily developments and change that chart that Jorge showed us earlier. And, and part of what I'm feeling heartened by is you're representing it's your problem to solve for in some sense. And local government has not always thought about the development community in that way. Um, yeah, I mean, for us, it's... Not it's, alone, of course. Yeah, but. not alone, but I think for us, and particularly this administration and our team, it's personal, right? Like, we wake up in these neighborhoods with vacant lots. Like, we have the same lived experiences of many of the residents that, um, that comprise the diversity of Chicago. And so we want the same access and the same quality of life and conditions that other folks have in other parts of the city. And so, yeah, it's personal. And I think the housing supply and affordability crisis, because it is that, is going to require us to move beyond who we typically look at as our developers mm -hmm. and developer partners. And again, the panel that was here today was great in that they represented the folks who are going to go into communities and honestly do the more difficult, That's right. not, again, and if you're looking to get rich fast, do not go in development because it ain't happening. <laughs> That's right. But they will go in. Particularly in high target in areas. High tar exactly. Yes. Right? And, and you're not doing at scale, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the margin on smaller projects mm -hmm. just isn't there, particularly if you're looking to serve the community that is there and not, quite frankly, displace and That's gentrify. Right. That's and right. so we're going to have to engage community, mm -hmm. uh, or folks from the community in this effort because mm -hmm. they know it, they love it, they care about it, and while others may not see it as a place of choice, it is a place of choice for them That's right. because that is where they come from. So mm -hmm. we need to support them in terms of being able to address the opportunity to build housing in those places that are not at scale mm -hmm. but certainly meet a need, and you're going to have mm -hmm. to have government, CDFIs, and other players recognize the importance of broadening who we think of mm -hmm. as 
developers uh, in a place. Mm -hmm. it, it's so necessary. I knew how rich this panel was going to be before I did it, but now you all know how rich this panel is. So thank you both for joining, sharing your expertise, and doing the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, day in, day out. Mm -hmm. Thank you to our first panel. Thank you to Tag, who's been a thought partner and friend mm -hmm. in this agenda for, uh, research uh, over really a couple of years. And to all the developers who joined us, thank you. Uh, Amazon literally wouldn't be here having this conversation, and we heard units wouldn't be here uh, but for that. And thanks again to Wells for underwriting some of that research. And I hope that you join us uh, and approach all these folks and offer them uh, new ideas and ask good questions. And so thank you for joining and uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue. <laughs>